It's good to see everyone. And uh, if you have been following along with us from week to week, you know that we have been discussing uh, principles. And the principles we're on right now are the principles that Jesus is teaching us about false teachers, about those who are not what they seem to be religiously. So we have been in the 23rd chapter of Matthew where they started <clears throat> and uh, if you notice Jesus was talking to his disciples and a multitude of other people when he brought up the subject of Moses' seat and he said these Pharisees and scribes sit in Moses' seat that is a seat of authority and to religion which is something that men like to do in most any avenue of life is have the chief seats and that's what he said they did religion. Not only did they do that, they wanted the chief rooms as far as at feasts and they loved the praise of men. In fact, he said everything they did was to be seen of men. And the last thing we were discussing was in verse 27 of that chapter, he said, you are likened to whited sepulchers when, which appeared beautiful outwardly, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. Now he had already discussed the fact that uh, they appeared to be something they were not. But this is another illustration of how that appears. You know, a lot of things are beautiful on the outside. For instance, you ever see an ugly whiskey bottle? They're beautiful. There are some whiskey bottles that are actually worth a lot of money because the bottle is so unique. But what was inside that bottle was what problems are caused for men. And the same thing inside us is where the problem can be. Not just these men that he's talking about, but this engulfs all of us because we're talking about the heart. You see, the main thing we don't understand about religion that is separate apart from earthly things is that uh, God gave us a judgment to use when it comes to this world. But it's also based on a nature that God has given us. And he has given us instructions about how we are to conduct ourselves. But many times we draw the line in different places there and say, I'll go this far, but now I, I'm not going to go along with that. And so everybody's got their opinions about things. And that may be okay in certain realms, but not in the realm of God. God is the only one that has the authority. But man likes to take that in religion as well. We like to do things our way. And so because of this, you have multiple, multiple religions and different Faiths that you can choose from today. Not so to begin with. But as you look back in history, this was back, this took place, this actual setting here, prior to Jesus becoming our Savior in the sight of men. And so these men didn't appreciate him. They were supposed to be looking for the Messiah, but they didn't recognize the Messiah. If you look in the first part of John, as he is the first chapter of John, here he's talking about the Word in the beginning. The Word was with God, the Word was God. Then in 14, and the Word dwelt among us and became flesh. Our God dwelt among us and became flesh. And he said in, I believe about verse 4 or somewhere along there, that Jesus was the light of the men of the world. And he said he was the light in darkness, but the darkness comprehended him not. You know, sometimes what's standing before us, we don't see it for what it is. And that's the way Jesus was. He was talking directly to these people, and a lot of them didn't see him as he was. And this is one of the reasons for this lesson you just heard. Jesus was going about proving himself. And then the Holy Spirit came behind him confirming him. 
So Jesus had to prove himself. We have to prove ourselves too. And the way we prove ourselves is by doing what Jesus did. What did Jesus do to prove himself? Anybody know just right off what Jesus did to prove himself? Well, that's true. But here is something that you need to keep in mind. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 says what? All right. Let's look at that and let's think about that just for a minute. Though he were a son, you know, we're sons and daughters belong to some father here on earth. How do we prove ourselves to them? Well, they didn't want it, right? Jesus said, obey your parents and the Lord. This is right. So, how do we prove ourselves to the Lord? By obeying our parents. Now, what did Jesus do? He obeyed God, his Father. He always obeyed his Father, even to the point of dying on the cross. You don't get any more faithful than that. Now then, think about that as you read this verse. Though he were a son, yet learned he what? Obedience. By the what? Things he suffered. A lot of times when our parents tell us to do something, We'll do that because we don't see any problem doing that. But that's going to be a, a real difficulty for me. Sometimes we just want to rebel. I'm not going to do that. Well, Jesus, if there's any such thing as a reason to rebel, that would have been. But not with Jesus, because Jesus was unique. He was perfect. He was made perfect by his example. And since he was made perfect, now get this, the latter part of that is, he became the author of eternal salvation to who? All that do what? Obey who? Him. Now then, you say, well, I thought you were supposed to obey your father. Jesus is the son. But what did Jesus do? He obeyed the father. Now, if you obey Jesus, what are you going to do? You're going to obey the Father. Because the Father said, listen to my Son. He gave him authority for you to obey him. He made him perfect. And he is the author of salvation. In John 12, 48, he's going to judge you in the end of this. Because he said, he that rejected me, this is Jesus, he that rejected me and saves not my words has one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same God judges me that I have spoken. Thus, what you're doing is obeying God because God sent Him as our Savior. And we don't need to ever forget that because they are not separated in that sense. They're one in purpose and everything. So when you obey Christ, you obey the Father. In fact, 2 John 9 through 11 says, He that transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. Why? Because both of them are united in this. You can't obey one and refuse the other. You refuse Christ, you refuse God. A lot of people think, well, I'll just bypass Christ and go right back directly to God. No, you won't. And everybody that's rejecting Jesus Christ is going to miss the Father because they didn't obey the Father and they missed the Christ. And so this is what's happening with these men. What were they doing? These men we're talking about, the Pharisees. What were they doing? They were rejecting Christ. They were trying to get him in every way they could. They were never satisfied with anything he did because they did not want him to take their power. What they called their power. They didn't have any power. But that's what we've got to realize is we don't have any power other than God. We don't have any. No man does because he's our creator. So all of this means that inwardly when he's talking about the sepulcher here, outside it looks good. We may look good, we may look like we're really good people. We may sound like we're good people because we may quote some scripture. 
But just quoting scripture, unless we do that, we're no better than anybody else. No matter who quotes it, no matter who or what position they may hold themselves to be, what name they might choose for you to call them, man is simply a messenger of God if he is true. That's all he is. We are his servants, regardless of what we do in his kingdom. And we all have a part to play. Whether we can preach, whether we can teach, we can set an example. We can listen to God and we can be what he asks us to be. We better be because if not, our hearts are not in it. So this is what Jesus is trying to emphasize here with these, these false prophets. And notice too, once we've learned it, Proverbs 4 and 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You see, what we do from the heart is what we are. Not from this world, but our heart, the center of our thinking, our capacity, our able to understand and to comprehend. That is what matters to God. Does it come from the depths of our sincerity? Or do we do this because there's an ultimate motive? And so the heart is what he was talking about, about the sepulchre, about the platters. And Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual, and notice this, wickedness in high places. There are those who are spiritually wicked that are in high places who are then in the souls of those who follow them. And men have a tendency to follow men more than they do God. Because we can see a man. We can hold him up in high regard. We don't see God. We just see his word. But that word is more powerful than all the men that we can look upon. Because God made us all. So we shouldn't be honoring men in this respect. Nobody takes the place of God or Christ. So the last thing we're talking about was the heart. We're going to discuss that a little bit. In uh, Matthew 12 and verse 34, it says, O generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What he's trying to say is, how can you say something good if your heart is not in it? You won't for long. You're going to try to play both sides of the field because you have an alternate motive. If that heart is not right and not genuine, you're not meaning what you're saying when you're talking about God. And that's what is individuals, individuals now. We've got to understand this applies to me, to you, to every, every individual. Because every individual will be judged individually, not as a group. Not based on your parents, not based on your friends. It's going to be based on what we do. So he said, how can you out of an evil, evil heart speak good things? Also, in Matthew 12, 35, the next verse says, A good man out of the, now notice this, a good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. Out of what? The good treasure of the heart. If the heart's good, the heart's pure, the heart's clean, it's going to give you the truth every time. God had a pure heart. He never lied. He never did anything sinful. If you think that wasn't a test for him, but yet he lived among us and proved himself. He proved himself to the Father, too. But in 35, he says, A good man out of the good, good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, whereas an evil man out of the evil of his heart, or evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth evil things. Now, Again, the outward appearance, the things that people may appear to be, a lot of times is what draws us to their attention. But what did the Bereans do? 
It sounds like the Bereans in the scripture. What did they do? They searched the scriptures for what reason? You see, there's a standard, and it's not to listen to some man that you like. I'm not saying you don't listen to him you like. That's not the point. That's not the ultimate point. The ultimate point is listen to somebody tells you the truth. And what is the truth? John 17, 17. The word is the truth. Then. Therefore, if a man is teaching you something that's not in this scripture, but now you got to listen to this too. What he said to start with about these people. He said they stand up and they, they read the law of Moses. Now this is prior to the Christian age. He's teaching what's to come when he was here, trying to get them to cross over to the new law when he got here. But they were still under this until his death on the cross. And he said, you do what they say, but don't do what they do. It doesn't matter who somebody is as far as teaching you the truth. If they're teaching you the truth, you obey the truth. But don't do as they do. And this is where we fail. Because we follow me. What did they do at Corinth when they were being established as a congregation? What was the problem Paul was writing to them about in verse 10? They had, they had division, wasn't they? That division was what? Following after different men. You see, they were not united in that they were following after the word. This one baptized me, so I'm of him. This one baptized me, so I'm of him. No, they were preaching the gospel, but they were following after men. Why? That's what they had done until Christ came. Some prophet, some man, Moses or whoever, they were men. They were not Christ. So they always followed after men. Tradition is with us everywhere we go. And we bring it into the church if we're not careful. But we have to listen to God's word to get those things out of you. In fact, they were bringing it in so much until they were obeying the tradition of men more than they were obeying God. He said, These men honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why? Because what were they doing? They were teaching for commandments, the doctrines of men, instead of God. They were teaching the traditions of men, and they were putting them above. God's will. This is what you see in religion today. The biggest portion of it is tradition to me. If it weren't, we'd all be united just like the Lord got you with Christ to begin with. Didn't stay that way very long because man has a tendency to do his own will because out of his heart he makes decisions. He's got the same choice as anybody else to follow Christ and follow him completely. I follow him partially and try to follow the world too. You can't do that. Since you can't serve two masters. So you see, it boils down to one thing. Are we united in Christ? Ephesians 4 talks about how we need to be united in Christ. Keep it in unity. Why? So that we're not led astray with every wind of doctrine that comes in. We unite on Christ's word. And we leave our feelings out of it. Our choices out of it if we're going to give ourselves to him. First thing a man does if he comes to Christ is he's supposed to be down himself. And that's what we keep doing. I'll deny it to a certain point, but hey, I gotta do this and I gotta do that because that's my treasure. What did he say in chapter six? What is a man? What is in a man's heart? Go ahead. In his heart, so is he. His treasure is whatever's in his heart. Because they're the same. Now, if it's God, then you're the thing. But if it's anything other than God, then it's superior in your heart to God. You're not loyal to God. Loyalty means you are totally loyal to Him. You say, but how can you do that? You got these other things to do. Yeah, you got things that are lawful to do that. But you need to be doing it. If you don't do them, you don't follow God. You don't take care of your family. You don't feed your family. If you don't take care of your brother, 
If you don't take care of a stranger, if he's offended. Those are things we can do. But we're not to put them down and step on them. We're not supposed to take out our anger on them. Christ didn't do that. Therefore, if Christ didn't do that, we're not allowed to do it. So it goes back to the heart. This is why we have a heart that's not clean, because it still has the wool in it. Going back to Corinth, what did he say in the third chapter there? I couldn't speak unto you as well. I couldn't speak unto you as spiritual. I'd speak unto you as carnal. That means like the world. That's carnal. That's dead. Why? Because there's envy and strife still among you. Is that not carnal? You need to get rid of it. There needs to be no division. How can we be totally united? Only in God's Word. Just like God and Christ are divided. Not, not divided. We're not to be divided. We're to be united. Because that's what they are. They're one. And we're to be one in them. In John 17, 20. One like they are. Totally here. No difference. But until that heart can be trained to do that, we're going to have some problems. But when we obey the gospel, he gives us that time to change. But we've got to change. We can't stay the same. We're a new creature. So let's look at uh, what uh, Paul said about this. And, uh, well, first of all, though, let's, let's look at a situation here that we can relate to, too, that he brings up. Uh, talk about the evil man out of the evil of his heart. Number four, David thinks. We've talked about David quite a bit because David is a very popular character and uh, has a lot to contribute to the scripture. But David said, Create in me a clean heart. This is found in Psalms 51 10. Create in me a clean heart. Oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Now, what is he saying here? Create in me. How do we? How does he create a heart that's pure in us? By cleansing the word of God. Now, how do we cleanse that? We get rid of the sin. We get rid of the guilt. And we get rid of the sin. The shame that goes with what we've done is wrong. And now we're whole again through what? Through Christ's blood. But notice what else he said. Along with that heart, renew. Now think about this. Renew. What does it mean to renew something? Make it good again, right? Make it clean again. Make it right again. Because the spirit that's in me right now is not right. They're the wrong spirit. So whose spirit needs to be cleansed? The spirit of God. That's what needs to be in us. Making the moves for us. That's why we deny ourselves and let him in our lives after we become Christian. David was saying, I'm not right. Make me right. David knew he couldn't do anything about his sin. He couldn't get forgiveness of his own. Nobody can. God has to give us that. He's the only one that can give sin. Now, I want you to notice something that Paul said, being one of the uh, popular people in the scriptures. In Galatians 2.20, let's turn there right quick. Let's, let's examine what Paul has said. We've heard this quoted several times, but let's, let's really take a, a good look at this and put God in the heart. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified, yet I live. Now, I want you to think about it. I'm crucified, yet I live. So what does crucified mean? Put to death. So how does he live? Notice what he says. Not I, but Christ liveth where? In me. Now as long as Christ is living in you, and as long as Christ is taking control of you, you will not say You will not be. But you've got to keep it mad. As long as we're in this body, 
We've got the temptations of the flesh that are always there and always happen to you. Always give you problems, always give you pains, anything to take your heart and your mind off of God. Somebody's aggravating me, somebody's doing this. Yeah, the devil. If he's not going to let up, then the stronger you get, the harder he's going to get up. Until maybe he finally walks away. But you get stronger up. Because that's what he did with Christ. You get to him. You'll pull scripture to him. He'll leave you. Because he knows he can't deal with you as long as God's in you. You don't know scripture, he's going to take you for a home. This is why the word needs to be written in our minds. Paul said he's in my heart. He lives for me now. Notice what he did say. Not I, but Christ liveth in me for the life. Now notice this. The life that I now live in Christ and the flesh. Now, pay attention to what he's about to say. I live by the faith of my Savior. Is that what he said? No, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You say, my faith's not strong. Well, that's because God's not. God has a strong faith. If we turn it over to him, everything we do, it's going to be strong because he has a strong faith. Paul didn't say, I live by my faith. He said, I live by the faith. You see, we're not, we're not to choose our own faith. There is a faith, but then there's the faith, and that the faith is what everybody has to abide by. And that's the faith of the Son of God. What was it that was perfect? His faith was total complete submission to God the Father. And that's the way you and I live. When we're baptized, we're a new creature. Now that doesn't mean that the flesh is not still bothering you and it's still going to get in your way. But there's Christ there to forgive you if you confess it by being straight. That's what David was doing back then. We've got to be willing to do that and put it away. Not saying, well, I've got to sin again later because you should say no, 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 no. That's not the way to look at it. See, you've got it in your heart to do it again. Repentance means I'm not putting it away. I'm not going to do it again. Think about Peter. What did he say when he was going to tempt Christ? God told him he was going to tempt him. He said, oh, no, 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 He said, yeah, you're going to tempt me. You're going to deny me three times. You're going to deny me three times. You do it. Have you ever told yourself, I'll never do that again? And the first thing you go, why did I do that again? That's because the flesh is still out here. It's going to stay out here. Your heart belongs to God if God lives in your heart. If God is cleansed your heart, if He's keeping it from your heart. Otherwise, the world is going to fill it for impurities. And that's what happened to these people. Even though they knew the scriptures, they were leaning toward the world and everything they did. That's what a hypocrite does. Jesus was made perfect, and therefore he is the one that tells us what to do in our life and to give the word to everybody. As individuals, we have to make up our mind. Is that what I want? Am I going to be wrong? Or will I say, no, so and so believes this over here, and I, I believe that too? So and so is not God. These men are not God. No man is God but Jesus Christ. He was true God. He was true God. So our hearts we need to keep them and we need to keep them as a good treasure. Proverbs 3 and 1 says, My son, forget not my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments in the middle. Let thy heart keep my commandments. You've got a choice. You've always got a choice. They have a choice. And you're going to make it one way or another. And a lot of times, just by doing nothing, you make a choice. We don't have to do something to do. Our time is
is up, so I thank you for your attention. I hope you'll study behind this. Meditate upon these things. Consider your heart because it is your, that's what it gets you in life. And also, I pray.